so I'd like to start uh, by thanking uh, the Clay Institute for this, uh, as, as well as Harvard. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a Harvard boy from birth. Uh, my grandfather was professor here, so it feels like uh, coming home. Um, he's probably spinning in his grave now that I'm at Yale. <laughs> OK. So uh, um, I'm going to talk about something that's, that's actually related, uh, at least in my mind, to the solution of the Martin conjecture. And uh, many of you perhaps have, have seen um, what's called the Sullivan Dictionary. It's a very nice way to relate uh, results, theorems, structures uh, in the Kleinian world and the Julia set world uh, to each other. And I, I want to show you how there's another object that, that you can fit into this dictionary. And a surprising number of things seem to translate. So this is just supposed to be uh, an expository uh, lecture with pictures. So let's go. Uh, so, so remember that uh, you're seeing things from, from an analyst's uh, pers perspective. So uh, Danny Caligari mentioned that uh, he saw me speak in 1995 at the Ferris Colloquium. So I was actually talking about work that I had done with Chris Bishop related uh, to the Alfors conjecture. But we reached a certain point in our work where I said to Chris, now it's time for us to declare victory and withdraw. And uh, it was pretty clear we, we were not going uh, to get there, and I'm very happy that uh, we are we are there now, and so uh, I I want to look at um, tameness um, from a, an, another point of view. There's sort of a hyperbolic uh, manifold in the background, but it's not it's not strictly speaking a hyperbolic manifold, and um, it's uh, it's an unusual looking one. But you're supposed to think of uh, the manifold coming from something like a quasi-Fuchsian group. And there's supposed to be some notion of distortion uh, there. OK, so um, none of the images I'm going to show are my own. So Jeff Brock, where's Jeff? He's trying to hide. There's Jeff. Uh, Nam Gyu Kong, who is my student, Scott Sheffield, uh, and uh, others. And uh, there's a theorem I'm going to mention at the end where distortion plays uh, some role, and uh, we're just about to release a, a manuscript. And my co-authors are Kari Ostela, Antti Kupiainen, and Eero Saksman. OK, so, uh, so let's set the stage. Uh, we're going to have three objects uh, under discussion here. One is Kleinian groups. The second one is rational dynamics. I just put down Julia sets. I don't insist on Julia sets, but things related to Julia sets with uh, rational dynamics. And uh, stochastic Livner evolution, or SLE. So uh, I will uh, give a definition in a minute and draw a picture. So first I want to draw, let's see, I think, let's see, yeah, probably this one first. Okay, so I want to draw the. Uh, so here's here's the upper half space, here's the real line, and I'm going to draw the world's most uninteresting domain. So, and there it is. Okay, and this this is going to be sort of the simple example uh, one looks at in SLE, and so you have some parameter called kappa. And what you do is you produce a curve coming out, and it should grow. So you think of it as growing up. And when cap equals 0, this is just a straight line out of the origin. You have a forcing term in the background. And you increase this guy, and, and now it starts wiggling. Now, okay. So 
Un unlike um, Kleinian groups or rational dynamics, here time plays a role. So there's a time parameter, and you have an object uh, that evolves. And it evolves sort of in a Markovian way that uh, once it gets someplace, like it's a straight line, it starts over again. So in the case of a straight line, it just keeps going straight up. Here, it gets to a certain point, and then it just keeps evolving by the same rule. And there's a nice composition rule, and the, the uh, past and future are, are independent. So what I want to do is take these three, uh, these three uh, objects and view them from the point of view of um, a dictionary. So I think the Sullivan Dictionary is one of uh, the most wonderful inventions. There are many dictionaries now in mathematics, and these always prove to be very fruitful because even if you don't have an exact analogy, many things often go through and you learn something in one situation for another. OK, so now here is a, the world's most beautiful picture uh, of hyperbolic three manifold. You're inside the hyperbolic ball. This is Jeff Brock. OK, and then, so, oh, this is Kurt McMullen. Sorry. Both. OK, so here's my question to you guys. How come the limit set has positive measure in your picture? <laughs> sure, it sure, sure looks like it. Oh, right. So this is a picture of a degenerate, uh, a degenerate group, and uh, there is a kind of uh, uh, model for that uh, buried in here. Okay. So here, here's another nice uh, uh, picture of limit set for a Kleinian group. And uh, so I want to point out one very simple feature of this. You have a limit set, which has some sort of fractal structure. And then the, uh, the complementary domain, so the ordinary set, uh, here is a bunch of nice circles, disks. And so the geometry of the components of the ordinary set is, is uh, different from the global geometry of the limit set. It's a very simple fact. OK, so here's a, here's a, a, a Julia set. So I guess this is a, a Dua D rabbit. And you see, uh, again, the nice uh, fractal structure. And again, you notice that the, the, the two components in black have some simpler uh, geometry than, than the overall Julia set, so those are quasi-circles. And this is a more complicated one. That's a picture of a Hermann ring. I think this is a Charita's picture. OK. So, uh, so SLE um, actually has sort of Two names now. No one knows what to call it. Uh, stochastic Leuvner evolution or Schramm uh, Leuvner evolution, uh, named after Oded Schramm, who tragically uh, died last year in a climbing accident. Uh, so Schramm, Schramm was a really remarkable uh, mathematician who was. Uh, many things simultaneously. He was a geometer, he was a probabilist, and many other things. And um, let me write down uh, this, this equation. So we have the time derivative of some conformal mappings is uh, minus 2 over f t z minus b of kappa t. All right, so, so here's what we've got. So. So we have uh, f dot of z. So there's a there's a time parameter is minus two. That's just a normalization uh, factor over f t of z minus b of kappa t. So b is Brownian motion on the line. Uh, so I'm going to be a little pedantic here and put in omega. 
which will uh, appear later. And so let me now draw the upper half base. And then we fix a realization. Well, first we fix a, a number kappa. And then we fix a realization of Brownian motion on the line. And we produce a family, a time index family, of uh, Riemann mappings. Okay. And they map from the upper half space to the outside of some closed set. And we start with the identity mapping. And uh, so they're going to map into the upper half plane. And as time evolves, the line will get so sort of sucked in here and, and grow uh, up like that. Um, so it's an exercise. I think I can do it. Uh, it's the limit of my algebraic abilities to write down what happens with kappa equals 0. So, so for in this case, you just have a nice closed formula because that goes away. And so you have the square root of z squared minus 4t. And the 4 has something to do with the 2. And again, that's just some sort of normalization. OK, and then uh, if I take another realization of uh, Brownian motion, but I take some kappa positive, then I get a picture like this, and I'll get more pictures. Okay. So that's, that's the setup. So here's a picture of one. So I guess this is kappa equals uh, 4. And so now the picture that, uh, that I'm showing here, you can think of it two ways. You can either think that uh, it's somehow growing out of the line, which is just down here, and going off that direction. Or you can think of yourself as kind of focusing in on some, some region and just magnifying that. OK, um, now let's see, be, before uh, discussing Wiener space, wh why do this? So it turns out that um, physicists, especially conformal field theorists, just love this because it gives uh, a way to uh, rigorously get your hands on lots of results that are very difficult or, uh, or uh, one doesn't actually know how to get them. From, from lattice models in physics, where you take a, a continuum limit in a lattice model. And I'll show you some pictures of those. OK, in any, in any case, um, it uh, provides a mapping from uh, Wiener space. So I see Dan Strook there, right? So now I'm going to offend him and uh, tell you uh, how you can view Wiener space if, if uh, you're not a probabilist, and even if you are. It's just the unit interval this Lebesgue measure. So you, you pick a point in the unit interval, call it omega, because that's what probabilists call it. And now this gives you a curve dependent on omega. And then I set a speed in front of it called kappa. OK. OK, and so here it is. This plays some fundamental role in conformal field theory. And for certain values of kappa, corresponds to physical models. We'll take a look at these. And the parameter kappa controls the speed of Brownian motion. OK, so here are some special values of kappa. Kappa equals 2 loop is loop erased random walk. Kappa equals 3, which I forgot to put down, is easing boundaries. That's conjectured and been reduced to some apparently technical lemmas, but it's, it's not completely polished off. Kappa equals 3 is the Brownian frontier. 
So I'll show you a picture in a minute of this. This is, uh, I think this is the sort of the big advance that really grabbed people's uh, attention is due to Lawler, Schramm, and uh, Werner. It's conjectured uh, to be the way to uh, rigorously produce self-avoiding random walk in the plane. Cap equals four, that's a very special exponent. Um, there's something called the har harmonic explorer. Um, cap, cap equals six is percolation clusters. So I, I put Smirnov's name in here because Yes, a theorem that uh, scaling limit of uh, percolation on the triangular lattice and, and a few others is um, SLE6. And this, this allows you to, to do things that the, the physicists wanted to do. And eight is the uniform spanning tree. And there's a, there's a conjecture here. I'll show some pictures that uh, cap equals eight is related to the traveling salesman problem. So that's a picture of kappa equals two. So you're supposed to think of these things as getting successively wiggly. So for a small kappa, it should still look sort of like the real line, but it, uh, or the imaginary axis sticking out. It's sort of straight, but it, it's starting to wiggle. Whoops. Ah. So this is both kappa equals, uh, well, this is, this is kappa four-thirds. So here, here's, here's another strange relation, uh, very beautiful. It's the Lawler-Schramm-Werner theorem. So the uh, black, forget the, the circle, the, the, the black object is um, the image of Brownian motion in the plane. So you just start Brownian motion, say at the origin, you run it for time, finite, say time equal one, and you get a beautiful uh, compact set of Hausdorff dimension two and now, if you look at the exterior to this domain, or you look at any of the domains, so if you look at this picture, you'll see that there, well, here's another complementary domain. There's one, there's one. Oh, no, not that one, but uh, up in there. And those are all SLE eight thirds. And this proves that. For example, that the uh, the boundary of this object, not the, the object itself has Hausdorff dimension two, but the boundary of any of the components has dimension four thirds. Okay, so that that's uh, that is uh, SLE six, I guess, and that's SLE eight. So SLE eight is space filling. So it's it's hard to draw. A, a curve that's filled all of space because you just get a black curve. And this is uh, intended to show you that there's some other way to get it. Okay, so let's go to uh, the Sullivan Dictionary. So it provides uh, a way to translate results and proofs from one category to another. And uh, Sullivan had two languages. So one was you looked at Kleinian groups, finitely generated, say, uh, and then you have things like limit sets, etc. And uh, then we have, um, oh, that's supposed to be one and two, and uh, somehow my PowerPoint got angry at me. Look at that. Uh, um, so that's one and two. Uh, the second one is supposed to be Julia, Julia said, rational functions of uh, degree greater than or equal to two, and, and I want to throw in SLE. So let's just take a look at what it, what it means to be uh, a dictionary. So, it, so we have three different worlds, a Kleinian world, uh, rational functions and their dynamics, um, and SLE. 
and uh, we want to translate or roughly translate various uh, statements, theorems, structures. So first of all, let's just notice that all of these are uh, some type of holomorphic dynamics. So you can view the, because you can view them as all, as all acting on the two sphere. So with SLE, there's a there's a problem because uh, we don't know a good analog in higher dimensions. So there's nothing like the three ball, and I will come to this at the very very end of of my talk. But uh, they can certainly all be approached, or certain aspects of them. Um, by viewing them as all uh, subjects in, in holomorphic dynamics. Uh, now, not everything has to translate, right? So, or you have to be careful. So, let's just let's just look at what we've got here. So, the first entry would be limit set for Kleinian group, Julia set for rational, and SLE trace. And it it sort of all makes sense. Uh, we have pictures; they sort of look the same. We'll look at some more pictures. And, um, but there's a difference, of course. So this, this trace is, uh, comes from time as a parameter. So that's, that's clearly different, and it, it evolves. And these, the other ones don't evolve, they just are. Of course, you can view them as coming through some iterative process. So in a certain sense, you can add a time parameter there also. OK. and. Um, so you also have the ordinary set for Kleinian groups. You have Fatou domains for Julius sets, and you have SLE domains. So let's let's just uh, go backward. Let me show you uh, what I mean by an SLE domain. So so here there are an infinite number of them. So we've run our curve for some time, and there are two big components. There's a left side and a right side. So what's, what's happened here is um, so for 4 less than kappa less than 8, you get some spongy looking object. These Jordan curves stop becoming Jordan curves, and then at cap equals eight, they become space filling. So I should have put less than or equal here. And so you get infinitely many complementary domains there. And that's, that's what I mean by uh, this entry, SLE domain. So I mean one of, one of these domains complementary to what's called the trace, this curve. So let's look at another entry. So we have uh, a parameter space. So in the Kleinian world, an example would be Teichmuller space. Uh, in the rational world, an example would be Mandelbrot set. And for SLE, your parameter space is the unit interval. Okay. Now, that sounds really boring. Except uh, the unit interval um, is a is not the best way, perhaps, to look at uh, Brownian motion because you can just view this as an infinite product, a countable product of unit intervals, and so then suddenly you have an infinite number of parameters, and we'll actually see a picture of uh, parameter space we'll, uh, uh, where I'll attempt to draw an infinite number of parameters. OK? OK, so just to go back here again, in the Kleinian group, we have uh, limit sets, and that corresponds to the rational function Julia set. And now we add the trace. So the trace is just the name for uh, this curve, and it's called k sub t. You can let t go to infinity also, 
here. And again, uh, so the slight difference in, uh, in, in, the, in the dictionary entries here is for SLE, the dynamics have time as a parameter. Okay, so let's look at uh, another example. In the Kleinian world, we have uh, the ordinary set, S2 minus lambda. Rational world, we have the Fatou set, S2 minus the Julia set. And in SLE, we have the upper half space minus uh, the trace. So the trace, so here I have K. It could either be for finite time or for T equals infinity. So in, in the cases here where kappa is between 0 and 4, we just get a Jordan curve that goes off to infinity in the upper half plane. Okay, so that's, that's uh, underneath the red there. When kappa is less than 4, you get, a, you get a Jordan curve. So, of course, it's a, an almost surely statement. So, for almost every point in Wiener space, uh, you get a Jordan curve. And so, there are two components. So, there's the, there's, the, there's the left. If I shot this off to infinity, I would have the left-hand side of the curve and the right-hand side of the curve. And in the case where kappa is between 4 and 8, um, we would get infinitely many components. OK, so now um, let's talk about uh, the parameter space. So again, an example in the Kleinian world is, is Teichmiller space. And in the rational world, the Mandelbrot set for uh, z squared plus c. And uh, let's, let's be a little more careful now about uh, the analog for SLE. So we fix kappa. And now the parameter space uh, that we're given is Wiener space. So it's called capital omega. And you can regard it as the unit interval with Lebesgue measure on it, d omega. And uh, parameter is simply a choice of Brownian, Brownian trajectory. Now, the role of kappa is we don't evaluate the trajectory at time t, but at time kappa t. And um, this, is, this is the same up to a measure preserving transformation as putting a, a factor of kappa to the 1 half in front of the Brownian motion. There's, there's just no difference from a, from a measure theoretic point of view. So, so there's our, our parameter space. But I want to show you later that um, a, a kind of natural way to view it is uh, what's usually done in Brownian motion is to view the unit interval as a countable product of unit intervals. OK, so let me give you some more. Um, uh, entries in, in, in the dictionary. Um, and here, here things get uh, a little bit funny. So in the Kleinian world, you have, uh, uh, of course, or it, well, you, ha you have the inversion. That's one of the main uh, Mervius transforms, there not being that many elementary ones. And then the art is to get a group uh, with nice properties out of that. But now, you can conjugate, of course, a Kleinian group with an inversion, and nothing changes. And you can move your, you can just move your limit set by inversion, and nothing changes because on the Riemann sphere nothing changes. And rational world, it's 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 just the same. So now in in, in SLE, um, you would think that this would be a very simple problem. So this is called uh, the reversibility problem. Uh, and so here it is. So you just map z to minus 1 over z. So that maps the upper half plane to itself. So it takes 0 to infinity and infinity to 0. So you take this curve and you go like this. And you get a new curve. And the question is, is that SLE? That's the reversibility problem. That's, that's much harder. So where's Da, da Pong? There, raise your hand. So Da Pong Zhang there has a beautiful theorem that says 
yes, this this works for kappa uh, between zero and four, and there are some problems uh, improving this when kappa is larger than four, and so there are, there are special cases that are known there. So kappa equals six, and sixteen thirds is the other one. You know. And 16 thirds, which corresponds, so both of those have special physical significance. Six corresponds to percolation clusters. 16 thirds uh, corresponds to easing. Okay. Okay. How about uh, how about finiteness? So, do you have finite number of uh, domain classes? Uh, well, in the Kleinian world, we have the all fours finiteness theorem, so that's fine. Uh, in the rational world, you might want to translate this as Sullivan's non-wandering domains theorem for Fatou domains. So that says that every Fatou domain uh, eventually becomes, uh, well, every Fatou domain is pre-periodic. So it eventually lands on a, on a nice uh, cycle. So in that sense, you only have a finite number of uh, domains. And now in SLE, there's, there's, there's only some sort of statistical version because we look at a picture like this and there are an infinite number of domains. Um, it turns out, however, that, uh, that there is a, a, a more complicated um, Finiteness theorem, and that uh, that states the the following: that um, that if we look at the inside, so this is SLE kappa. If we look at one of these domains that appears, it's SLE 16 over kappa. So there's some strange duality uh, that appears there. And so all these uh, interior domains are, in a certain sense, in the same class. So are they related by some sort of Mervius transformation? No, but they have a beautiful statistical uh, distribution in, in many senses. OK, so here's uh, another reason we're celebrating uh, the Martin conjecture, because it's false in, in the world of uh, Julia sets. Well, or rather, the all fours conjecture is false. So this was proved by Buff and Sherry Ta. So let's go look at, at uh, today's handle bodyists. So um, the all fours conjecture is, of course, a consequence of the works of Agol, Caligari, and Gabay. And so in the Kleinian world, there, there it is. That's a really great achievement. Um, and of course, you have the same question in the world of rational dynamics. Is the Julia set either 0 or 1? And uh, there's beautiful work that provides counterexamples. And uh, it's, it's done in the quadratic family. Even okay, so the, this this shows you that the the dictionary does not have to translate perfectly, but bo both problems are, in my opinion, anyway, equally interesting, and you learn a lot from them. Now, if you translate immediately uh, to the trace for for SLE, is this zero or one? And by that I mean in the upper half plane. Um, it's a relatively easy theorem. It was one of the first uh, theorems shown. And um, here's a slightly weaker statement that if I take the dimension of, of this trace, it's the maximum of 1 plus kappa over 8. And then when you get to kappa equals 8, it's just 2. And it's space filling at, uh, at uh, kappa equals 8. So yes, you have positive measure. Turns out there's still mystery at kappa equals 8. So I'll show you a picture later. Here's the mystery. So this is supposed to be kappa equals 8. It's actually, this is, can anyone recognize this? Anyone know what it is? It's Germany, 
Right. This is a, l a large collection uh, of cities in Germany. You solve the traveling salesman problem for them exactly. And it's conjectured, it's, this is not a statement about Germany, by the way. It's, it's, it's conjectured that you get SLE8. So, uh, and this has been verified pretty well. One can do pretty fine calculations. There's a guy named Nick Reed at Yale who has some very beautiful work. Here, here's the idea, though. You uh, take, take the following uh, non-Teutonic model. Take the unit square and with just throw down with uniform Lebesgue measure on the square random numbers of points, large numbers. Solve traveling salesmen. Take a limit. Rescale the limit and look at it. And it looks like that. And it's, it should be SLE8. So there's actually microstructure. There should be microstructure uh, in here. So it's, um, I don't know exactly how to translate this very nicely um, into the world of Kleinian groups. OK, so let's look now at uh, positive measure and distortion. And uh, I will give my vast oversimplification of why the all fours conjecture is uh, now settled. It's because Mervius transformations have zero distortion. Okay, so that, that clearly is not a proof. Uh, however, uh, you can get a hint that it should be much harder to prove uh, the corresponding result for Julia sets because when you iterate a polynomial, unless the polynomial is very, very carefully chosen, so the parameter is, is, is just right. Um, the iterated polynomial is going to build up enormous uh, distortion. And so anything could happen when you zoom in uh, from the global to the local picture. So and then the question begs itself, well, how, how about SLE? What does distortion um, what is distortion there, and what does it mean? OK, so uh, I'm going to go on. I want to state one theorem. And here, here's again this uh, statement that the geometry of the components is nice. And if you remember, I showed you the beautiful picture of the, of the limit set where the, the uh, components were circles. Right? And uh, so. Here you have the same phenomena as kappa is between four. So if we take this kappa, we put it between four and eight, then kappa prime gets smaller. And the components have boundaries that are smoother. OK. Now, OK, now we get down to uh, Wiener space. So of course, everything in, in this dictionary must come with some sort of partition arising uh, from a group. And uh, so in, uh, of course, in hyperbolic geometry, you have uh, tilings of the hyperbolic plane by uh, beautiful fundamental domains. Uh, and you have the orbit of, uh, of a point in the ordinary set, for example. In the world of rational functions, you have think, think z squared plus c. You have Markov partitions. And here you can look at the inverse image of a point in the Fatou component. And now we come to this point I was making about parameter space, that S in SLE, um, the, there are Gaussian coefficients in the representation of Brownian motion. And we can associate to them. Uh, a, a partition. So let's look at the pictures. So here's the usual one from from Kleinian groups. So there's a beautiful uh, Fuchsian group. Ah, okay. So now I want to focus in on this one. So this is a Julia set, and this is uh, the Markov partition. So uh, let me go over here. So um, these are, of course, they're arranged in generations. So if you Take one of these. Uh, by the way, the uh, the little uh, festoons here are, are purely artistic. They have nothing to do with dynamics. They're, they're just to catch the eye. But you'll notice they they all look the same. 
if you take one of these guys and iterate once by the z squared plus c polynomial, you pop up into the next higher level, and et cetera. So you go flying up, and, and so there's a natural ordering on these. And these are places where Green's function uh, looks like 2 to the minus n, as you go from n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, down towards the Julia set where Green's function goes to 0. And the Markov partition puts a natural partition on, on the Julia set. OK, I, I'm just a poor country analyst. So here's my partition. So this is the standard partition that's used in either function theory uh, or in domain decompositions. It's essentially the Whitney uh, decomposition. And so here I've just drawn it for the upper half plane. So we've got the real line down at the bottom here. And then we have uh, rectangles. So the rectangle is twice as long as, as it is high. And they come with dyadic sizes, 1, a half, a quarter, an eighth, et cetera. And of course, the, the picture continues in the other direction. So that's, that's a nice Markov type partition, actually. And here's its image under SL, an SLE map. So I want to show you this again. So this is in the upper half plane. Okay. So we take one of these boxes, we look at it here. And now I'm going to map it over there. And they get distorted. And sorry? Oh, this would be kappa equals something like 2. OK. Yeah, you can see there's a, there's a black curve uh, that you can barely see. And that's the, that's the SLE trace. OK, and where, where does this come from? So now this is the parameter space. So there's uh, Paul Levy wrote down a very simple way to realize Brownian motion. We just pick uh, independent, identically distributed n01 Gaussian coefficients ai. So i is an interval. And um, so we pick a Gaussian coefficient for each one. These, uh, these intervals come from the partition there. So there are corresponding intervals down on, on the real line under each box. Each one gets a coefficient. And you get a little tent function uh, that's supported on the interval and has height 1 half times the square root of the length of the interval. And that's, that's a representation of uh, Brownian motion on, on the line. And the point is that each interval, think of it as a, as a, as a box. It's easier to see. So, so a box here has an interval here. It gets a Gaussian coefficient. And that Gaussian coefficient basically controls the Schwarzian derivative of the conformal mapping here. So where the Schwarzian is, is big, the coefficient is statistically large, and vice versa. OK. So, so now these, uh, let's look at kappa between the 0 and 4. And I'm going to try and wrap it up here, um, because I, I want to state a theorem and tell you I don't quite know how to do this um, outside of the category I'm, I'm discussing. So if. If we uh, stick in this category with kappa, now I'm going to take kappa strictly between 0 and 4, then the complementary domains are holder domains. So that means that um, the Riemann mapping associated to either domain from, say, the upper half space is a holder function. So it's not just continuous, it's very continuous. Um, now I want to say something about reflection across the boundary and show you a picture. So suppose we wanted to create a quasi-Fuchsian uh, group. So I stole this again from Jeff Brock's homepage. Well, so you. 
do something like simultaneous uniformization, and you solve a Beltrami equation. Okay, so there's Beltrami. Notice, notice that I forgot the square root of minus 1. So there's supposed to be um, an i there in the de definition of the derivatives d and d bar. And uh, we have quasi-conformal reflection. We have simultaneous uniformization. And now the question is, is the same thing going on here in SLE? Do we have a similar phenomenon? Okay. So uh, by the way, one of uh, the kind of enemies that one has in polynomial uh, dynamics um, is, um, is uh, it's a kind of two-dimensional analog of, uh, of um, the Mostow rigidity uh, theorem. I, sh I should tell you that Dan Mostow was horrified when, when I explained that this was an analog. I mean, he told me this doesn't look like an analog to me. Um, nonetheless, um, it's, it's a good analog because in 2D, the, the Mostow rigidity theorem is false. So, so what are you going to do? Well, you replace it with something that's true. So we say a, um, a homeomorphism of the sphere is exotic um, if it's not a Merbius transformation, but it's holomorphic off a prescribed set K. Now, if K is positive measure, it's easy to make these uh, exotic homeomorphisms by solving Beltrami, but that homeomorphism might not have any relation to dynamics. And so there's some entries here from this dictionary where you uh, look at Mostow rigidity. Um, you have, uh, and then you have, for example, problems about dynamic uh, rigidity, which maybe I'll, I'll skip because I'm running out of time. And now we come to the, the SLE analog. So a sample theorem is that for kappa less than 4, the trace is rigid. So there are no exotic homeomorphisms. And this follows from uh, roden schramms theorem that uh, the, the complementary domains are Holder domains plus a result due to me and Stas Smirnov that says the boundary of a Holder domain is rigid. In other words, there are no exotic homeomorphisms. And this is a pure Sobolev space theorem, where you do um, you do some complicated fundamental theorem of calculus, and uh, show that it, it's it's very much like quasi-conformal mappings. You have to show that you're in the space one derivative in L1. Okay. And finally, let's let's go to distortion. So now I I hope uh, the Kleinian people. We'll feel happy again. So let's recall uh, that uh, in the, for example, the Kleinian world or the rational world, a, a common method is to deform things by using a quasi-conformal mapping. Uh, in SLE, there are no quasi-conformal mappings, but there are st ones that are sort of statistically quasi-conformal. So in the quasi-conformal world, in, when you write down Beltrami, d bar f is mu df, then uh, mu has, has, has sup norm strictly bounded by 1. But it turns out there are versions of the measurable Riemann mapping theorem, which hold in the case even where mu is equal to 1, but mu is strictly less than 1 often enough. And so here, here's a, a, a nice theorem due to Ali Lechko from the 1970s. So it's a technical result. So you fix a point Z, and then you draw a circle around it. So you look at R e to the i theta. And then you take 1 over 1 minus the absolute value of mu at a point on the circle. So you integrate around the circle, and now you integrate from 0 to 1. And if this is plus infinity, that means there's a solution uh, to Beltrami that's a global homeomorphism. And the proof is actually something that's used in holomorphic dynamics all the time, that you get uh, 
bounds on sums of moduli and the moduli sum to infinity and everything becomes under control. Okay, so now I'm going to end with a conformal welding theorem. So uh, in conformal welding, you have a Jordan curve gamma, which is uh, a boundary of of two domains, and you let f and g be the mappings from the unit disk to the inside domain, g from the outside of the unit disk to the outer domain. And now you form a homeomorphism of the circle by taking f, which takes you from the circle to the curve, and then you go back from the curve to the circle by g inverse. And that's, that's called uh, a welding map, and the curve is called a welding curve. Uh, and uh, so, of course, one of the great theorems is due to, to the all force family, and it's that if you have an all force quasi circle, then that quasi circle uh, arises in a very specific way. In other words, the welding map you can sort of write down a priori. So you know which classes of welding maps, they're called uh, quasi symmetric. Um, will give rise to uh, curves. So the problem uh, there that one looks at is you just have a homeomorphism phi, and you're now looking for a curve where this is realized. So there isn't one in, uh, in general, and you have to have something special. OK, so I'm going to end here with uh, another dictionary entry. Um, so. Quasi-Fuchsian group is in the Kleinian world. In the rational world, we would have, say, a quasi-circle Julia set. And um, now you see the, the problem here is these are curves through infinity, and there's something pesky about them, which is they're, they're not Jordan curves. So what, what you would like to do is fix a point and then blow up around that point, And when you blow up, you would get a, a Jordan curve that goes through infinity on, on the Riemann sphere. So you would get a loop. But strangely enough, we don't have a way of getting loops from any of these uh, models. And I want to show you now a theorem that provides loops. So there's something called the uh, Gaussian free field. And we're going to exponentiate it after subtracting infinity. And we multiply by a constant. And then we get the derivative of a homeomorphism of S1. And the theorem is this homeomorphism gives rise to a welding curve, and the welding curve is rigid and unique because you have holder domains. And the question is, OK, so there's a theorem. We, ha we can make these loops out of a very similar probabilistic process, but we don't know that they're SLE. And now the time dynamics has completely disappeared. There's no time. These are static. So here's what it looks like. It has, um, it has some complicated form. And let me end with uh, this picture, OK? So this is uh, May 1st. It's the, it's the chart of the Sarah Lee Corporation. The ticker symbol for Sarah Lee is SLE, OK? And now, if you get an MBA, you are taught something that's actually not correct, but let's say it anyway. And that is that the price which is here, looks like Brownian motion. Okay? And uh, many people should groan when they hear this, but uh, that's the standard model that's taught. Now here's, but there's something interesting about this. So, so Brownian motion in this world is also generating an SLE, but there's a second piece to this picture, which is this chart on the bottom. That's the volume of the stock trading. And it has exactly the characteristics of the measures that are produced by this strange formula. Okay, you exponentiate this Gaussian free field, 
which is not a function. These are not functions. This sum, these are distributions, and you have to subtract infinity to make uh, integrals converge. And you get these uh, strange uh, multifractal measures like this. So I'll just end by showing you the, uh, this is the largest experiment ever done. Okay, We don't actually know who did it. But this is uh, the Wilson microwave anisotropy probe. So this is a picture of the uh, microwave background. So red is hot, uh, blue is cold. And this is supposed to be the Gaussian free field. Um, the physicists also call it the massless free field. It's that object that I was describing before, except mine is more infinite than this one, and and I would exponentiate this. Uh, and, and by the way, the great thing is um, this is not the Gaussian free field. Right? One has now looked at this, and so there's kind of a crisis in cosmology because because it's not. But that means they have more left to do. Okay, so I will stop there. Thanks very much. Oh, um, oh. For example, the outward um, measure projection is proved not by two-dimensional methods, but by three-dimensional um, topology or geometry. So you need, you need that. Where is that? Oh, so I, I can explain, first of all, where it is, and then uh, what I think the real answer to your question is. So first of all, um, the, the way I actually think of this thing is, um, this is like the ordinary set, and there is a hyperbolic manifold coming out of it. Now it's easier to see here because you have a welding map, and you have you have pieces of this glued together in a very strange way, and you have to understand the statistics of of that gluing. So there really is uh, uh, a 3D version, but let me give uh, what might be a more convincing answer. See, which one is this? I think I want this. Oh, here we go. So it turns out there's a 3D version that we don't understand at all. And this this might have a four actually the uh, the four the four D well, believe it or not, I mean uh, there was there was an experiment to check if our universe is a compact hyperbolic manifold. And uh, the answer appears to be no, um, fortunately. I don't know. It's, I think it's something more complicated. But, um, but the point is, you see something very strange here. This is a picture of, uh, of all of history. We start with the Big Bang. And now it turns out that this, this picture I showed you before with the quantum fluctuations, well, sorry, with uh, the microwave background is basically an image of the universe at time 10 to the minus 35 seconds. So what happens? You have quantum fluctuations. You get so the universe is very compact. And you get little teeny uh, differences in um, the amount of mass in different places. And then you have an inflationary period named, this is something invented by Alan Goose at MIT. And it maintains these, these very small inhomogeneities. And now something very strange happens. So the matter in the universe takes a long time to congeal. Without these little seeds, these quantum fluctuations, we would just be a cold gas, nothing would accumulate. No stars, no nothing. Not Clay Institute, right? no Clay Prize. But because of these little quantum fluctuations, what happens is you get sheets where there's a little bit more matter. And the matter accumulates on these sheets. And then the sheets start breaking up and turn into what's called the cosmic web. So you have some two 
well, it's, it's a one-dimensional like structure. And the point is, uh, for me, that we, we ought to have a model that's able to create random sheets in three, 3D. So here, here's a random loop. It's one loop. I see the, the nice thing about SLE is it'll produce an infinite number of loops for you, but it won't produce one. And there should be some way for, by going into higher dimensions, uh, of, of building a similar non-dynamic process that produces sheet-like objects related to things like this. But notice I cheated my answer. Uh, the real answer is, I, I, I think you have to be careful about this dictionary. But, but the correct way for me, anyway, to understand the distortion is to build a hyperbolic three-manifold connecting the two sides just as you would with quasi-Fuchsian group and uh, simultaneous uniformization. This is actually, this is not a local problem because what you do is you, you fix a box. Think of the box as really big. And now you start pouring in uh, the, the points. And when you solve traveling salesmen, it turns out that there, there are uh, non, there, there are non-local structures that are automatically built in. But maybe I didn't well, quite. Oh, it's, it's very, very different. That's, that's right. But um, I think you sh um, so there, there are two answers that I can give. One, I mean, you have, you very often have lattice models that give rise to this. This is not quite a lattice problem but because it's an SLE. But my second answer is I think you should work on this because it's somehow related to degenerate Kleinian groups in a way that I do not understand. Okay. 